You're listening to Voice Actor Showcase, episode number 18. Hi everyone and welcome back to Voice Actor Showcase, a podcast about voice actors and their stories. I'm Jun Yoon. Please connect with us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Voice Actor Show. These episodes are also available on YouTube, youtube.com slash voicemoto. The Voice Actor Showcase is about the voice actors on their journey to realize the dream of becoming an established voice actor. We're interested in telling the stories of countless voice actors around the world who are working hard to make their dream a reality. Whether that means they recently joined a voice acting Discord server or recorded their third character in a AAA video game. Now, if you have an interesting story and you've been watching YouTube tutorial videos on how to use Pro Tools for the past six hours, I'd love to have you on the show. Please contact us by visiting voiceactorshowcase.com. And while you're there, please check out the store and pick up an introverted voice actor shirt or a brand new Record Get Money Get Tacos t-shirt for yourself or for your favorite voice actor. Of course, the sales from the stores will go to supporting the show as well as paying the voice actors in future episodes. Today, we'll meet a voice actor from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Growing up in a military family in southern Texas, she's the first generation American of Argentinian, Mexican, and Scottish ancestry. She's worked with a number of major brands like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Hasbro, and PBS, and is represented by multiple talent agencies across the country. Her main passion, however, lies in voice acting for video games. Her voice can be heard in major video game titles like MechWarrior 5, Fallout Frontier, Candyland, Soul Keeper Chronicles, Rose and Locket, and many more. We can look forward to hearing her voice as the cat pirate queen Elaine in the upcoming musical 3D platformer video game called Billy Bust Up by Blueprint Games. Please welcome Melissa Medina. Believe what you want to believe you've heard. Crazed captain crashes his ship into the Indian Ocean. Crippled Datto vessel nearly kills an entire station. Datto's ship abandoned after takeoff by the crew. But despite how hard they try, no matter how much they pay, Cliff and I will always know what really happened during those 26 days. We never told them about Patrick, allowing his son to inherit the payments for his loss. Nor did we ever tell them what really happened to Lara. As far as we know, in the public's eye, they were both alongside the other passengers. But so long as Cliff and I are alive, people will know the tale of Datto 6. How the only monsters we should fear are our own. How Artie Glenn became a name known across every station for his courage. And no matter how dim and dark space gets, there's always a shimmer of hope somewhere with some good that can come of it. Humans will always find a way to survive, even when we seem destined to fail. We'll go out fighting, because when the odds are against us, that's when we rise to the occasion and always find a way to turn them back in our favor. Because true heroes never know when to quit. Felix Cooper. Melissa Medina, hello and welcome to the show. How are you? Hola, I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that you and I are both self-quarantined in our <laughs> respective spaces. Yes. Keeping the general public safe. Like, why are people out right now at bars and restaurants spreading this stupid thing around? It's oh terrible. Oh, my God. Don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But you know what? I'm glad that a lot of people are doing that. Not out of fear, right? But just right. in general, being considerate. So thank you, <laughs> everybody who stayed at home. <laughs> Except for those people that are hoarding. What? Come I know. on. I know. I know. 
We're going to get, <sighs> we, we need to start a program. We get everybody a bidet. It's going to be genius. <laughs> Single-handedly put the TP market out of business. <laughs> nice. Nice. I'm, I'm behind you. Give me, give, me a, give me a signature board somewhere. I don't know. I know. <laughs> All right. Let's dive into it. Um, let's, as we begin every episode the same way, tell us about the little Melissa. What, where were you born? What kind of kid were you? And what was life like with your family, especially from the military family aspect? <laughs> yes, I'm little Melissa. Um, I was born in South Texas in a town called Corpus Christi, which is by South Padre Island, which I was very sad to see a recent post about like people getting together for spring break at South Padre because that's where I'm from. And I went, oh, lovely. Um, ah. But yes, it's also where Selena is from. Selena the Tejano singer. Um, <laughs> and nice. So I grew up listening to her stuff. Uh, it's a beach town. Great food. Good to visit. Stay for a little while. Uh, not the safest place in the world. But yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how you were as a kid, June, but little Melissa was a very shy kid. Uh, oh, were you, okay. Were you a shy kid? Because I oh, was. Oh, <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, I even got the word creepy quite often. <laughs> um, uh, mostly because I treaded very lightly. You couldn't hear me coming. And then all of a sudden, bam, I was there, like staring <gasps> quietly and not talking, like a tiny green eyed member of the children of the corn or something. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that it's, was it's, me. It's painting an interesting picture of little Melissa. That's totally. great. Totally. Um, I didn't speak much as a, as a kid because uh, when I did, um, I spoke Spanish and English growing up, and it was really important that I speak both perfectly to my parents. Um, and I just I didn't end up talking much until later, and now you can't get me to shut up. And yeah, um, my parents were very much the old school like disciplinarians of children should be seen and not heard. You know what I mean? Ah. Yeah. So military mindset right there. Um, I was lucky, though, that I didn't have to, like, move around a lot as a kid, like a lot of military brats do. Um, <laughs> I actually really wanted to, but I didn't get to. <laughs> um, my dad traveled a lot for his work. He had a lot of different, like, security clearances and stuff. So we didn't really, like, know what all he did. So that made those, like, take your daughter to work days, like, really boring. Because <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't see anything. Like, this is wonderful, but at least I'm not in school. So. What are you doing, Daddy? It's classified. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, just stay on the computer and play Doom or something. I got to go work. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, as a kid, I love to dance. Um, I wanted to choreograph dances, which I did embarrassingly so with friends and uh, sing, and acting had never once occurred to me. Um, <laughs> um, and I've actually never considered myself to be like a particularly good actress or anything. Um, I still kind of identify as a singer mostly. Um, so the whole voice acting thing is kind of kind of fresh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Fresh yet so successful. Right. <laughs> Which we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, I guess. Um, no, I honestly, I really assumed that, like, as a kid, my parents would influence me to join the military. Like, like the rest of it. Like, I have two older brothers, and they're yeah. in the military as well. But um, I feel like maybe they knew better. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm a bit rebellious, especially with authority, and I can be kind of a lot. So I'm sure they didn't want to, like, subject the military to me. <laughs> and in, uh, in some ways, though, I know it was because I was the only like, creative type of person in my family. And ah. somewhere in there, I think my parents liked that. Like, <laughs> they had the whole stoic military thing going on. But in a nutshell, they were like, oh, she's an artist. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, let yeah. her spread her wings. <laughs> right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, family hippie, though. So, you know. <laughs> And speaking of creative things, I mean, most voice actors that I've talked to so far uh, grew up in, in, in environments that, that had a bunch of cartoons, video games, mm -hmm. movies, and music. What were some of your favorite things that encouraged the creativity in you? Oh, man. Uh, movies, for one, mm. insanely important to me. So I, I love horror and sci-fi movies. Ooh. Um, I know, uh, but I, I actually particularly love Korean horror and sci-fi films right now. <laughs> yes. 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 Spanish, French, and Japanese too, but it's just interesting seeing how all the cultures kind of come together and what everybody is sort of mutually afraid of, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, books led to movies for me, though. So, like, um, as a kid, one of the only things that I could, like, reach out to my dad on was horror books. 
<laughs> and then horror movies. So he was a huge Stephen King fan. So we ah. would buy two copies of Stephen King books, and we'd both read them and then talk about it like like our own little book club or something. How cool is that? <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then once my family kind of like we fell on hard times financially, we couldn't buy two, two versions of everything. So uh, my dad would buy the book. He would read it first. And then I would. And then he'd forget what happened in the book. And then <laughs> like we couldn't <laughs> talk about it as much. So when we couldn't do books, we sort of bonded over um, Stephen King movies. So, you know, like one of my earliest memories is from the movie Creep Show, which had a bunch of Stephen King stuff in it. And he even does some acting in it, which is amazing. No oh. joke. If you haven't seen it, you should. Well, now I will. <laughs> it's so <laughs> cheesy, but in the best way. Um, but yeah, it was in this like anthology series boom of the 80s and 90s. And um, we watched a lot of classic anthologies like The Hitchhiker and The Twilight Zone. And, you know, even X-Files had some one-offs. So just all kinds of horror and sci-fi is what I grew up on, which maybe is why I was a weird kid. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it just sounds like you and your dad have a really great relationship. <laughs> yeah, Are you the favorite child? Kind of, kind <laughs> of. I was definitely the weird child, that's for sure. Um but yeah, I mean, but I fell in love with movies and music and video games, like, really early. Um, and, like, with this really deep connection, and I think everybody has that, right, which is kind of cool. Right. Uh, not to get too deep or anything, but, you know, those things were a way for me to deal with what was ultimately kind of a pretty difficult and violent childhood. So those things were a great escape for me. Mm. And I wasn't even aware of how deeply entrenched they were for a really long time. So I learned very quickly to turn to movies and games for a bit of a break, you know, from things. Um, and it was great because my I, my two older brothers so graciously gave me their hand-me-down games, which meant, like, I played everything a year or two late. <laughs> 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 and I think I still do that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about video games since that's a lot of what I do, you know? Yeah. Um, and I have to say... One of my favorite games growing up that I was thinking about recently was the Tomb Raider games. Did you play those at all? Oh, yeah. Laura Croft is... Right. I'm a, I'm a boy. Okay, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I love Tomb Raider, too, because, like, sure, she was problematically proportioned and is, like, <laughs> ultimately your typical like, Indiana Jones, rich European, stealing artifacts from largely brown people. But it was still a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but in the first game, she's like a single lady out there with her bad self taking on a T-Rex at one point. Ugh. And then like, <laughs> instead of preservation of the species, she's like, bam, 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 dead, moving on, you know? <laughs> we but, come from a generation where Italian plumbers were going through worlds. <laughs> so, <that's true. laughs> you know? <laughs> like, sure, that tracks. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? Now it's a multi-billion dollar and a franchise. So there I you know. Go. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> But yeah, so there were some good games out there around that around that era, you know. But they're horror games too, Silent Hill stuff like that. What did you play? I, you know, I haven't. I've I've been trying to get myself into The Last of Us, which I have not Ooh. yet touched. I I know uh-huh. I need to play that game. Yeah, I know I need to. Ugh, one of these days, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't like horror. I, I I like fun and fun and and wholesome things. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> that makes sense. I need to play Animal Crossing. That's what I've been. T- that's Ooh, what I've yes. been told. People are losing their minds over it too. That's Apparently, what I've heard. It's really fun. Well, let's make a pact right here, right now, <laughs> Melissa Medina. Animal Crossing for both you and me. Done. Get out of this horror thing that's happening in real life right now. Ugh. I know there's plenty out there. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, shifting gears here, on your website, it specifically says. Assistive technology is very important to me. <laughs> what is that about? Wow, you did your homework. Yeah. Um, assistive technology is really important to me. Um, I I feel lucky enough to have grown up with like hard of hearing and deaf family and um, blind and low vision family and friends. So like communication and inclusion are like, I don't know, they're sort of the main things that help us stay human and empathetic, you know, if that's not too grossly philosophical. Or no, whatever. agreed completely. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, my dad's parents were both deaf and my mom's parents only spoke Spanish. 
And so the few times we get together, there'd be a translation train、ah. from like sign language to English and then to Spanish. Whoa! And believe me, there was a lot lost in translation. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, but it was cool to try to like help them communicate and stuff like that. And、um, so along with that, you've got like the immigrant experience and and the deaf of hard of hearing experience coming together. Uh, my mom worked for the state, helping blind and low vision people get ex- assistive technology. Wow! And like, it really just helps level the playing field and like make life a little bit more convenient and and less isolated, you know? Huh? <clears throat> But yeah, my mom volunteered me pretty much every summer to help staff like a summer camp for children with visual impairments, and they're they're sighted friends and family. So, like, we could help sighted people learn how to do sighted guide, which is where they kind of, you know, hold onto your elbow and you can walk and and kind of guide them through without using a cane. Hmm. And like, how to use a cane? We would even like walk around blindfolded so they could sort of understand like the non sighted experience. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was really fun, and so yeah, I kind of became obsessed with these cool little gadgets that that the blind and low vision people had. Like they have the little braille writing tools and really early text to speech stuff.、Um, we had these phones that were、um, were these typewriters that were connected to a phone line,、huh. and so it was called TDD machines or text to phone machines. So we could talk to my grandparents that way before you know before we had internet and texting and all kinds、wow. of cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great! I, the, I'm sure it's that personal connection to、uh, assistive technology that's out there, as well as that's that's been in the past with your with your family is what's、mm-hmm. um, promoting and and energizing your drive for diversity and inclusion. Yes, absolutely. And I I spent ten years in IT, so you know working with teams of developers and stuff. So I've gotten to kind of inform creation of apps and stuff like that for. Yeah, early phase little things that can help with like accessibility tools in phones and stuff. So there's so much out there that is going on with that. So I think it's really cool. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, tell us a story or two from the high school days. Oh my God.、Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we're in、uh, for a treat. Here we go. Melissa was a very different person in high school.、Um, I, That's why it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a big、uh, choir kid, choir and theater kid. Nice.、Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I wasn't nice though. <laughs> I wasn't. I was really mean back then. I had a lot of anger, June.、Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. Like, like mean girl, mean or just no, like just I like, hate everyone. Yeah, like I、wow. hate the establishment and police and blah. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Bad girl. Syndrome, I guess. Did you ever wear spikes around your <laughs> neck or wrist? I totally did. <laughs> yes. 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 Right.、Badass. And now, like, there's a little bit of that person still inside me, which is cool because I get to play that in in different roles now. You know, where I'm like,、yeah. hey, we need kind of a a mean lady, and I'm like, oh, I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know. But then you know, you learn and grow, and you realize that's not okay, and you got to work on your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but、um, I was a really、uh, I was a bad student too. Like I just I I struggled with homework. Like why why do I have to do this? And、um, yeah, I I learned a lot of lessons about like、um, actually going to class and <laughs> how valuable oh no. Oh how no. valuable having a regular schedule is. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know what? I I eventually got my stuff together, and you know, graduated and went to college. So yeah, it it turned out okay. <laughs> hey, as we do, you know what I mean? That's、yeah. uh, stuff. Adult happens, and life happens, and yeah. Everybody who's listening, who's in currently in high school with bad grades and spikes around your necks, it's、yes. fine. Yeah, look at Melissa. Gotta... It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you eventually gotta get your stuff together, though. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to graduate and like, you know, have a job. <laughs> Let's go right into the university area. Then you have a BA from University of Texas for、yes. vocal performance. Talk to us about your college experience and your major as a singer. Oh, that was so much better.、Um, <laughs> <laughs>、uh, so yeah,、uh, I studied vocal performance and pedagogy, which is teaching. Um, I struggled a little bit at the beginning, but then eventually made my way and、um, got to take part in a lot of musicals and operas.、Mm. There are some cool classes that you can take, which、um, 
I think I try not to mention very often because people go, I want to take that class. But like I took history <laughs> of rock and roll and stuff like that. Ooh, in school. Nice. Yeah. Um, but the operas were fun. We did like Nozzi di Figaro, Tosca, La Traviata, La Boheme, stuff like that. Um, yeah. And my favorite, by the way, opera is Die Zauberflöte, uh, which is the magic flute by Mozart. It's awesome. <sighs> Nice. Yeah. Never heard of it, but wow. Oh, I think you, you probably <laughs> have, but not know it. Um, oh. It's like it has one of the quintessential little arias in it. It's the Queen of the Night aria. And it's one of the ones that you hear all the time in movies and stuff. So you might have heard it and just not, not known. But yeah, and we got to do cl- uh, like musicals and such too. And um, that was really cool because I, I, I won a scholarship because I certainly couldn't pay for college. Um, and we got to tour a little bit. So we went to like Japan, Australia, Germany, I think wow. England and a place called Canada. Yeah, oh. it was good. And oh, we had a lot that, of <laughs> that exotic land of oh wow, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I just felt very different than everyone else, though, doing mm. classical music and that sort of thing. Because most of the people that I toured with uh, had their parents paying for everything. They were groomed for these positions from like day one. Sure, took voice lessons in their youth and stuff like that. And like, I, you know, I worked two colleges when I was or two jobs when I was in college. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, my co- my college schedule, twenty four credits or units in California, and I went to classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm-hmm. and I worked Tuesday and Thursday. Yep. and the weekends. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, you get it. <laughs> I get you. I got you. So you're just dead on those days that you're at work, right? Just like yep. uh... <laughs> lots of cigarette and lots of bourbon. That's yep. <laughs> uh, how I got through college. <laughs> That sounds about right. That's actually Ooh. really classy for college. Good on you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yep. But yeah, um, I stopped doing the, the classical singing and stuff when I realized I needed to like pay my student loans. So. <laughs> and what better way to pay your student loans than, uh, than working? And yeah. uh, I took a look at your resume mm-hmm. and there's a really interesting item that, was, uh, that, I, that I found. It says you're an NBE certified echocardiographer. <laughs> It's got something to do with the heart, I'm guessing. Got the word cardio in it. What? What, what is that? Yeah. Um, wow. I yeah. I've had a lot of jobs, weirdly, <laughs> but um, I think because I wasn't doing things that I was actually passionate about, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I did that for a little while. I I left. I started tech support in IT, and that sucked. Um, and I moved into healthcare and you know, passed my certification. And so I was a fetal and pediatric echocardiographer. Wow. And that's like looking at blood flow for babies to make sure there are no, you know, life-threatening, congenital defects, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was it was good. Um, but it, it, it's, you know, admittedly really hard to be around sick babies every day. Yeah. Um, and I was not emotionally prepared for that. Um, so, you know, there's doctors and nurses that do that every day. Day, oh. And they deserve so much more credit than they get for that because I couldn't do it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's an amazing career. And, and I think more people need to do those things and just sort of find their way into healthcare because, gosh, it's needed. It's so needed. But yeah. Um, and then I, I left that because I'm a baby and I, <laughs> I went back to IT. Uh, but because of my medical background, I switched to healthcare IT and sort of Started my way back at the bottom in tech support, worked my way up again. And before I quit that to go into voiceover, (laughs) I got back into a great, it was a decent paying but miserable job that I hated for a large corporation that I can't name. Um, (laughs) And yeah, it was a nightmare. So I don't care how much they pay you, but like the lack of care uh, in some of those for-profit ventures like that can just be insane, you know? I, I, I say this in every episode, happiness matters first, you know? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So luckily, um, I'm a saver, so I quit to pursue voiceover. <laughs> and what a transition that was. Um, <laughs> before we dive into your huge library and, and, and resume of work, oh, I, I'd like to, again, start from the beginning. <laughs> what was the moment? Talk, tell us a story about the moment or instance when you definitely said voice acting, this is it. Mm, 
Uh, well, as I said, I was sort of miserable in my tech job, right? Um, I worked from home. Every day I logged off and I cried because like everything we did had massive consequences for thousands of people. It's a lot of pressure. And you're fighting doctors who don't want to use technology and all these other things. So I quit. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to go back into tech work. But after quitting my job, I said, you know what? I haven't taken a vacation in like eight years. Oof. So <laughs> I should Oof. maybe give myself some time off, you know? <laughs> so I did. And I started listening to the audiobook version of The Watchtower, again, Stephen King. Ha. And <laughs> the narration was so good. And I thought, man, I wonder what it takes to become an audiobook narrator. That's a thing, right? And I did a ton of research, and it seemed kind of doable. And I felt like I knew enough about voice, about books, about marketing to kind of jump in and, and just see if I liked it. Mm. You know, I wasn't even sure if I would like it. So I hopped on ACX, auditioned for a few interesting books, <laughs> <laughs> and got cast quickly. And, and now I'm over 50 books in, and I don't hate it. So that's good. <laughs> Beats IT. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> yes, it does. Okay. And it, and it continues from there. Just last year, you took part of the famous competition, Now Voice This 4, where you were one of the finalists. Congratulations. I know it's a little oh, late. Thanks. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Oh, man, it was really cool. I mean, I was still fairly new to all of that stuff. And um, I was astounded at how many talented people take part in that. I mean, you're talking people who are just starting out, people who are doing pro work, everything in between. I think it's awesome what uh, was it Chuck Huber and now mm -hmm. Voices in general is doing it because it gives visibility to the people who are just starting like I was at the time <laughs> and brings together people to kind of appreciate what it is we do. And like, sure, it's a competition, but, um, you know, it's also about sharing in the things that you're passionate about, which gave me um, the sort of motivation to start doing character work and stuff because I was mostly doing audiobooks at that time. Um so, you know, definitely more about the journey than the result, right? Um, right. I don't know if I'd do it again, but it was fun to try. Um, <laughs> I quickly found that anime was not exactly a good match for my voice. So <laughs> it's definitely something that's good for people who have those kinds of voices. And so, you know, um, I think everybody should try it. It's really fun. Not only is it fun, it's one of the most difficult things to do, ADR and anime. Oh, my goodness. It is. It's amazing. I just started learning about that recently, and I said, oh, my goodness, I um, I get it now. I, it's very difficult. <laughs> and after you realize your voice is better suited for characters, not in the anime realm, <laughs> um, you really found your niche in video games. Um, the biggest item on your list, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, is Mech Warrior Five. Talk to us mm -hmm. about the, your story about auditioning for that, booking it, and working it. Oh my gosh! So Mech Warrior was actually one of the easiest experiences I've ever had. Perfect. It was so chill, and I think that's what drew me to it. It all happened very quickly. Um, I auditioned for the role because it said, you know, corporate, cold, uncaring, kind of mean. And I went, oh, I can do that. <laughs> um, and weirdly, <laughs> I'm actually a nice person, but, you know, <laughs> I, I do a lot of angry stuff. So <laughs> I realized, though, that most of the lines were yelling. And so I was like, oh, again, yes, I made for this. Please pick me. Um, and I got the role and we recorded it, I'd say, three days later. Um, and, like, I got the... Uh, the script an hour before we recorded <laughs> and, and then we recorded it for a couple of hours with a lot of yelling um but when i hopped on a call with the folks at piranha they were so relaxed and chill and it, which was weird because it was only like a, a couple months before the launch so um as as that happens with development um sure. but they just said you know we trust you you came across exactly the way we wanted. So let's just do some yelling. And I said, okay. <laughs> and now one of the things that I love is when I see a stream of Mech Warrior 5 people and people have me as their garrison defense commander and I'm yelling at them. They yell back at me. And I <laughs> love that. Like, you destroyed this thing. And they're like, okay, sorry. And <laughs> I love it. And so it was, it's, it was a lot of fun and surprisingly easy. <laughs> Which I think is a sign of a good project. 
Absolutely. Yeah, when they have everything in order, and yeah. In a complete 180, you're also <laughs> the voice of Princess Frostline on Candyland. <laughs> Tell us about that one. That must be where your nice side comes out. Yes. Um, <laughs> so that's one of the weirdest things about my career so far has just been the sheer like dichotomy of character types. Like either I play like cutesy children's characters or like really strong, mean, sexy villains, <laughs> and nothing in between. Nothing in between. <laughs> So um, Candyland was great, though, because I got to add another children's character, sort of balance out the darker ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a long process. I think total it took over a year from casting just to even get the game out. Wow. And it, like, it just came out, I want to say, like maybe last month. And uh, I believe merchandise still isn't out yet. So it takes a while. <laughs> um, but I love Princess Frostine. Um, and I joke around because her name used to be Queen Frostine, but she got demoted, I guess, oh. to, <laughs> to a princess. Oh, that's not very nice. <laughs> so, yeah, still, still royalty, but not as up there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they wanted to avoid relationships in the games. So you have, like, King Candy, Princess Frostine, Princess oh. Lollipop, and stuff like that. So they just didn't want to put that in there. Oh, um, yeah, but overall, it's been really fun, and I, I like I didn't get to grow up with Candyland like a lot of people have, but I met a few people that did, and their excitement over the franchise sort of getting a reboot has been really nice and really refreshing, um, and nobody said anything mean about my Princess Frostine, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I was going to say. How is the fan reaction being to uh, Princess Frostine's lines and her voice? Good. Uh, most people have no idea it's me. Because um, <laughs> they'll look at my resume or they'll look at other things that I've done and they're like, yeah, that's that's not you, right? You just Me do dark Mech stuff. Warrior 5? What? Right? What? <laughs> um, but yeah, and then now when I see kids looking at Candyland stuff, like I went to the hospital the other day and there's a kid reading like a Candyland book or something. And so I started doing the voice and this little girl was just like, this is so cool. And so, you know, I don't know, maybe future voice actor in there somewhere. But yeah, overall, people have liked it, so I'm happy. <laughs> Wonderful. And out of all the projects you've taken part of, I think my personal favorite character out of all of them is Aerith in the uh, Aerith saga. <laughs> the French toast, the cheese and cracker jokes, I, I, my belly was bursting. You know, out of the many, many characters you've voiced in your career so far, I'm, I'm really curious to find out which character or characters were really fun for you personally. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so Aerith is definitely up there for me, mostly because of the people involved. Like, <laughs> I think that's what makes it the best. So, yeah, Aerith is this great combination of cyberpunk and 80s vaporwave stuff and Latin charm and ridiculous jokes, and I love it. Yeah. Um, because I feel like it's very easy to take yourself too seriously when you do cyberpunk and sci-fi in general, but it has been an absolute riot working with the creator, Brian Butvides. Um, There's also some serious voice talent in the show. Um, like, one of my favorite human beings is Matthew Curtis, who does all the cheese and crackers and all that jokes. <laughs> and that just comes out of his head. Like, that's the amazing thing about him is that he just roll that just rolls out like it's nothing. Nice. Um, so he's sort of like the master of ad-libbing in that regard. Um, but it also means a lot to me, too, because we have a great Latino cast with, like, myself, Shelly Baez, uh, Diego Valenzuela, and a, a lot of other ones that I'm not sure I'm allowed to announce. But, yeah, <laughs> um, we've got the pilot more or less there, and it's, you know, it's looking good. So, um, yeah, that's probably one of my favorites right now. And then Rose and Locket, which is another one that mm. I love so much. And um, it's these two guys from New Zealand, and they came out with this amazing Western sort of Mexican art style thing. And I'm like, wait, where are you from? And how are you doing this so well? This is awesome. So, yeah, those are probably my favorites right now, um, other than, of course, like Billy Bust Up and stuff like that. So, ah, uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so great. I mean, b before we move on with further questions, I just want to make a quick comment about your your positivity and enthusiasm i can i can hear Aww. it in your voice you know what i mean like as a person i think that's, <laughs> i'm sure that accounts for a lot of success and relationships and bookings and whatnot but I, I i think for from the from the perspective of an aspiring voice actor anybody who's looking at like a successful name like melissa medina <laughs> oh, 
I think I think there's a bit of a wall. I I, I think there's a bit of a wall there to, uh, mm-hmm. to penetrate through. Like, is that yeah. really who it is or what it is? Whatever. But I just want to make a comment that you seem and sound and feel very different, like a real person, positive and all that. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, honestly, uh, I am a cheerleader, and it sounds stupid, but that's if people are looking to do well in the industry, I think the best thing you can do is talk about other voice actors uh. and how amazing they are and all the other creators, like yourself, June, all of this stuff, because um, why not? You know? Yeah, it's about <laughs> elevating each other, you know? Yeah. And uh, Speaking of elevating each other, you're also... In addition to being an amazing voice actor for video games and characters, you're also a coach. Uh, you're an instructor at such a voice. Um, I'd like to hear some stories about you becoming, a, a, taking on an educational role <laughs> to elevate the other voice actors. <laughs> yes, I love teaching. So that it actually, you know, helps me use my, my degree a little bit for once. <laughs> um, it's been a blast. It's um it's nice. So I teach uh, commercial voiceover characters and then bilingual Spanish classes. And um, it's it's really fun seeing my students sort of come out into the world of voiceover and book and start to do well. And yeah. like one of my students got approached for a job while we were recording their demo <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> nice. Um, and they loved the script so much, the character, her voice. And so it was really awesome. And um I don't know. I, you teach, don't you, as well? Or am I mistaken in that? Taught. Okay. You get it. I, I it's do. It's nice to see people actualize and do things and chase it down. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes get imposter syndrome because I haven't been doing voiceover for decades like some. <laughs> um, but, you know, teaching allows me to use my degree and help other people. And I think that's the best I can do, you know. And I think... Um, one of the weird things about myself and the way that I teach is just like, hey, I made this mistake. Maybe try not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And I think that's the best we can do. I, I don't like it when people come out and say, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it. Um, I think everybody's a little different and they all learn a little bit differently. We all make different mistakes. That's for sure. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's been super fun to see my students coming out. And these are long programs that I'm doing. Usually they're about two months long. Mm. Um, So I'm just now kind of seeing some of my students come out and really book and feel comfortable. And it's really nice. I'm so proud of them. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you you a quick story. I don't know if I'll keep this in or not. But uh, my my favorite part of being a teacher who teaches creatives um, has always been the curtain of the curtain at the opening night when the last line is spoken and the final cue is pressed and the house goes black and then like they queue up for the uh, curtain call and then the lights come up and that's really when they see the audience standing and clapping for the very first time and their eyes just go you know, yes! <laughs> like they realize, holy, whatever, it's wow, we <laughs> did it. And, yeah. and and watching that happen on stage from the back is is what gives me the greatest joy. Isn't and it's it what best? gives me a confirmation that I that I enjoy and deserve and, and I belong in the directorial producing uh, area. Yes. The question I'd like to ask you, through the experience of teaching and being an educator who hands out information and elevates other voice actors, what is something that you have found out about yourself? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think I would say that one of the things that surprised me was how well things flowed. I, I really expected to, you know, take a very analytical approach because that's just who I am. Mm. Um, and I, I planned out this whole syllabus and I just had every all my ducks in a row. And then when I got in, it it just didn't apply to be this formulaic way of, of approaching things. So I found that I just sort of instead just let it all kind of come out. Yeah. And organically. And it felt so much better that I didn't have to over prepare and... Um, I think being way more relaxed than I ever thought I would be and realizing that, you know, I don't know if you 
you do this in your teaching, but sometimes I feel like I need to take on their performance almost and say like, okay, if they don't do well, I did something wrong, <laughs> you know? Right, right. Um, but I think that now I'm kind of learning that it's the, what is it? The the bird leaves the nest and you just go, man, go. <laughs> um, so Push yeah, them there's out. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of adjustment there and I didn't expect that. Fantastic. <laughs> Now, in to, to change topic at a, at a very abrupt point here, you <laughs> currently live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Many, many, both in the industry and out of the industry, would argue that making a living as a character video game voice actor not in Los Angeles <laughs> would be impossible. How do you do that? Uh, beg Angelinos and Californians to love me. <laughs> 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 no, um, <laughs> please love me. Uh, no, luckily there is some remote work out there. You know, I take what I can get. <laughs> um, I hustle my butt off too. Yes, um, yes. I actively canvas for work. I don't just leave it up to my agents to get me work because there is so much technology though to bridge the gap from like Source Connect to even like there's software for facial capture via the camera in your phone. Mm-hmm. So I think those gaps will hopefully lessen over time. Um, that said, I'd probably book like 80% more work if I lived in California, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, I'm not quite ready for that step yet. I don't think, um, that said my, my list of goals, one of the things on it is to engage more locally and just kind of get to know my peers here and not just in LA. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's not easy, but I think the main thing that I love to do is I actually really love the development process. It's like magic to me. Nice. And so I will reach out to developers and just be like, hey, how did you do that thing? Like, I'm not a developer, so you have to really dumb it down for me. But can you explain how you did that? Because that's so cool. And then, you know, eventually we just start talking. And it's really cool to support them also. (laughs) Yeah, communicate and reach out and take the initiative and reach out. Yeah, for sure. Even if it's just like, how did you do that? That's so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there's some developers here in, in Minneapolis and stuff that I talk to as well. So, you know, try to do both local and the L.A. stuff. A lot of the listeners that are listening to my to this podcast are not in L.A., New York, Chicago, Atlanta. They're more in the rural areas. I, I take that. I take that back. A lot of the voice actors that listen to this podcast are not situated in L.A., Chicago, New York, Atlanta. Mm-hmm. What is one, and I, I try not to make this podcast into an advice column. I don't want to be <laughs> like everybody else, but I think I think there's a lot of people that can benefit from your wisdom because you are living that life. Mm-hmm. You are not in L.A., Chicago, New York, Atlanta, but you're booking it. So <laughs> provide, if you could, if you would, provide one, just one actionable item that you can impart to the listeners here. Okay. Um, I think that one of the most important things in our business is to stay genuine and have genuine curiosity. And that will, believe it or not, get you work. People can sense when you're just pumping out work. People Mm -hmm. can sense when you're not actually interested and behind a project um, and you're treating it like a job and not something that you really love. And so... I think if anything, if you can cultivate a sense of genuine curiosity about things, you will book. And even if it's just interacting with people on social media, um, people will notice when you're genuinely interested and you have something to add to the conversation other than like or (laughs) cool. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I think that is one of my most um, one of the most overlooked things in the business is, and I know you can't take on every single project and be interested in every single project, but you can find something interesting, at least one thing interesting about what it is that you do or who it is that you're working for. And if you can't, maybe that's not the best place for you, you know? Yeah. Um, So I don't know. That's my little two cents. (laughs) No, I think that's great. Being honest about your desires and your interests. I mean, that's, that's universal advice. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that happens so. to apply to your voice acting. My goodness. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> nice. So, Will, are there any plans to move to L.A.? Oh, my gosh. I'm putting it off to, as, as often as I can. Um, it's scary out there. Um, no, I think that uh, 
I feel like all roads lead to L.A. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> I'm fighting it uh, mostly because, you know, um, I want to make sure I have the the means to continue doing voiceover. And um, I don't know if I'm comfortable with 10 roommates and stuff. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think it's still cheaper for me to live here and even go fly to L.A. a few times a year, which I'm doing. <laughs> right. Um, then it is to live there. So um, I'm putting it off, especially until things calm down. I mean, we've got fires and earthquakes and, and now... The coronavirus and yeah yeah so i'm gonna i'm just gonna hold off for a little bit <laughs> i think that's a good idea yeah <laughs> thanks <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty crazy out here right now yep <laughs> no offense to la but i i love la and everybody in it but um i think i'm gonna stay over here for a little while longer <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Last year, I worked as a, uh, a travel show host for a Korean TV show called Meet America. Oh. And uh, I visited St. Paul and Minneapolis as one of the stops um, oh. and got to meet a bunch of people and checked out the breweries, the Viking Stadium and the whole thing. Yes. Um, and I learned about the rivalry that exists between Minneapolis and St. Paul. <laughs> First and foremost, which side are you on? And number two, what is life like in the Twin City region? <laughs> it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> I feel like there's there's more of a rivalry, I think, between our area. And I think it's, I want to say it's Wisconsin. I could be wrong. But yeah, um, these little <laughs> Midwest rivalries. But we're in the Midwest, okay? So rivalries consist of like, well, I'm going to be slightly less nice to you, but still nice. You know? <laughs> So, Open your own door. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and just say it's for germs. But yeah, um, I, I wonder, um, I, it's, a, it's Mid, the Midwest is great. I'm not from here, but I have learned a lot about the Midwest. Uh, with the Twin Cities, it's a, it's a pleasant rivalry. So technically, I live in St. Paul. Um, but I go to Minneapolis all the time. And it's literally a five minute drive. Between yeah. <laughs> Minneapolis and St. Paul, so it's practically the same city. Um, but I like it because Minneapolis is your larger city. You've still got, you know, you've got skyscrapers and um, the tunnel system and all that stuff. A skywalk, rather. Um, and you know, in St. Paul, it's a slower way of life. Like I live in my old little house, and <laughs> and I like it. It's nice yeah. that you can walk to businesses. You drive less than five minutes, and you're in the big city. So. Yeah. Um, People are great because it's Minnesota. So you've got Midwest nice, but then you've got Minnesota nice. And (laughs) (laughs) people are always willing to hang out. And I mean, I'm not used to this. So I spent the last few years in Seattle. And Seattle is a bit standoffish. (laughs) Um, And so moving to Minneapolis, people would talk to me on the street. And I'd be like, who who are you? Why are you talking? (laughs) Oh, this is kind of (laughs) nice. Yeah. So they say things like, how are you doing? And then actually expect an answer, right? Yes. Like, oh, you care? Wow. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I love where I live. And I think the quality of life for the cost, especially here, is is unbeatable. So I like living in St. Paul. And yeah, I get some, you know, a little bit of jokes here and there for living in St. Paul, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, expect those hate mails to come in from the fans in the Minneapolis area. There we I go. know. Or they're going to be like, you. <laughs> How dare you? I'm not buying another video game with you. I know, right? <laughs> One of the things that we, we both love, though, is we love, like, cheese curds and oh, poutine yeah. and oh, just yeah. so much good food here. It's none of it is good for you, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and the beer. Oh, my gosh, yes. the beer. Yeah. I was not expecting that, but I feel like I've converted now. I used to be a big wine person, and I still am, but, man, I'm really learning a lot about beer since moving here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. The following questions are questions I ask everyone. Um, what does your recording space look like? What <laughs> year did you start out with? And what are you using now? I love that it's a mile marker of our progress. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I started out, okay, I'll start where I started. I started out using the microphone in my Surface tablet under a ah, blanket in nice. my bedroom. Yes! <laughs> you are and one then, of us! <laughs> yes. And then I spent hours cleaning up that audio <laughs> because it sucked. So, um, yeah. But when I moved out of Seattle to Minnesota, I set up a closet to be my studio, soundproofed it, 
um, yeah. with like you know a craft project of foam boards and foam tiles and whatnot. Um, yep. Yeah, and then I recently upgraded to um, the four sixteen, and but I still use my Scarlet interface, so yeah. I still have that. Um, I'm thinking of switching to something else, but the Scarlet hasn't done me wrong, you know. Ah. Yeah, um, I still occasionally use my tricked out version of Audacity with like millions of plugins. Ooh, fancy. <laughs> but mostly I use Audition now, which, you know, I mean, honestly, I'm not a gearhead, but I think you can have broadcast quality sound with good ears and an improvised setup. You know what I mean? Agreed. Maybe some retouching. <laughs> Agreed. I, there are so many stories of I booked a national commercial out of my closet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's true, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, it is. I've done the same. I work out of my closet every day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. What are some uh, short-term and long-term goals, as a, both as a voice actor as well as the person, Melissa Medina? Ooh, um, I have so many. <laughs> Begin! Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, so last year I focused a lot on video games because I didn't really know what my calling was. I was getting tired of, of audiobooks a little bit. Mm. Um, and I definitely am going to keep doing video games. Um, but I'm also now flirting with animation. And um, so this year I'm my plan is to double my efforts to do more Animation, not anime, but just, you know, Western style animation. Right. Quirky, crazy stuff. Um, I just don't think I have the voice or the exuberance for anime. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to find other stuff. Um, my long term goal is to be, you know, have a show on Netflix. And we're, you know, we're working on that with Aerith and a couple of other things. So, you know, who knows? Maybe that might be coming sooner than later, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Knocking on wood panels right now. Yep. Right. Yeah, and then I'd say short-term goal for myself. It sounds silly, but I really want to keep my workspace clean. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, no, you're one of those people. I am. Like, I'm so tidy and orderly all over the house except my workspace. I have, like, four water bottles, like, coffee cups, a bowl from breakfast. I don't, it's just out of control. I don't know why I do that to myself. And you justify it as organized chaos, don't you? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm like, well, I live here, so <laughs> this makes sense. And <laughs> But I'm in a closet, so I have a tiny little desk. So literally everything is impactful. <laughs> and occasionally I have, you know, you probably do this too, where you talk with your hands you oh, know, yeah. and you do stuff. And I have knocked into a bowl with a spoon <gasps> in it or something. Oh, no. And Clang and then <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, okay, it's time. It's time to clean up a little bit. <laughs> yep. So yeah, those are some <sighs> of my goals. <laughs> All right. It's been a long day, right? You've been in four different sessions. You're exhausted. It's working with four different directors that are just really tough to work with. <laughs> so you decide you're gonna go out. Forget the COVID-19. I'm going to go out. Don't go out. <laughs> Don't do that. But hypothetically, <laughs> sitting at the bar, bartender comes up and, and she's like, what do you have? What do you say? Ooh, oh, oh, um, I go for if I'm doing mixed drinks, I go for something with mezcal. Have you ever had oh, mezcal? Yes, I have. Of course. Yeah. I keep a stash of mezcal for like especially <laughs> rough days. <laughs> Nice. Yes. Um, I think you can't beat like a margarita with mezcal in it. I think it's like this great combination of you got the smoky and the sweet. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, man. I love that. Um, red wine is my thing, though. I, I love yeah. red wine. So anything from like Italy, <laughs> you nice. can count me in immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, you're you're a whiskey guy, yes. I'm a whiskey right? person, yes, indeed. Um, I'm not I'm not fancy. My my go to is usually a, a Suntory Toki. Nice. Um, on a rough day, I'll I'll spring for a Macallan Scotch. Nice. But I'm not opposed to Evan Williams either. I in fact I have <laughs> yeah. a I have one of those uh, Costco sized Evan Williams sitting in my in my cabinet. Oh my so, gosh, for emergencies, right? Pre precisely. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I've got to get my drink on. <laughs> Especially after a long day. You know how that goes. Yes. <laughs> I saw that video of you a while back where you're like, what ah, is the this secret? the secret of voiceover. <laughs> that was so good. Like, I have to follow this man immediately. That was wonderful. <laughs> Inspired by Carrie Walgren, who made this video on Instagram. Yes. And she was talking about coffee, right? The secret to voiceover, it's coffee. <laughs> I was like sitting there watching it. I have an idea. 
<laughs> More accurate. <laughs> and then she commented. We talked for a while. It was great. I loved her. She's great. Nice. That's oh, she's so fantastic, isn't she? <laughs> oh my gosh, one of the one of the best. Life goals, right there. The same, same. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Melissa Medina. As we uh, as we wrap our episode here, um, what is next? What's next for you, Melissa Medina? And what do you have coming up? Um, and what do you go? Where do you go from here? Oh man, um, I'm gonna keep going. That's for sure. Um, let's see. Next up, I probably have uh, Billy Bust Up, which is gonna be amazing. Mm. Um, they have already had insane amounts of success, and it's just so cool to watch. Um, they have. Tens of thousands of followers already, right? We're working with a composer from the My Little Pony movies. Nice. And even as a singer, it's going to be insane singing for him. Like, I'm going to be super nervous. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I feel lucky not only to be included in the cast, but that the project is remarkably inclusive. Um, And I don't think they talk about that very much. Um, So we have people from different countries coming together for this. they incorporated characters from all different ethnicities, all sexualities. Wow, nice. It's wonderful. Um, so, you know, my goal is to make uh, my character Elaine, the cat pirate queen, oh, yeah. into like a female Spanish scar from Lion King. Oh, um, sick. Ah, I yeah. love that. I think the refinement and the swagger of like, Jeremy Irons' scar from the Lion King is something I look up to. <laughs> wow. Oh, my gosh. Now, I don't know. I mean, I'm not nearly as good as Jeremy Irons, but I'm going to try, damn it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, then uh, Rose and Locket is coming later this year as well. Um, I love the story. It's so cool. They just came out with the story where it's a you know bounty hunter woman who's been blackmailed by an evil spirit who takes her daughter and locks her in a magical locket. She has to collect seven bounties to free her daughter from the locket. And um, the colors they use are gorgeous. It's got this, wow. you know, like I said, Western Dia de los Muertos type of aesthetic. It's just beautiful. <sighs> and then lastly, I think the other one, that the big one that's coming out is Soul Keeper Chronicles. Um, and you should check that out because it's, it's a 3D open world game, much like Skyrim, only I think it's more gorgeous. And, <laughs> you, <laughs> and you can ride dragons. So, you know, that's cool. I can't announce what character I'll be yet, but my face may be on a character. So who knows? Wow. Wow. Right? Technology is cool. Congratulations. Thanks. That's awesome. Thanks. There's some good <laughs> stuff out there. And I think now with everybody kind of staying home, there's going to be some amazing work done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes. And if the listeners here would like to find out more about you, Melissa, where can they go to find you? Uh, definitely, I'm on your social media of choice, uh, Melissa Medina VO. And my website, hearmelissa.com, has all sorts of things I'm working on, too. But uh, I'm remarkably accessible. You can reach out, say hi. It's always nice. She'll use the nice voice instead of the uh, yes. yelling commander Hello. voice. How are you? Thanks. No, it's too much. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> It's been a great, pleasant, and what a fun conversation. Thank you very much for your time. (laughs) Thank you for having me. This has been a blast. I can't wait to hear more about the upcoming project, and I hope everybody here goes to check out Billy Bust Up, Melissa Medina, all of our socials, and give a follow, like, and comment, and DM. And I'm so excited for you. (laughs) Gracias. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad that you're doing this. And you definitely got a regular listener out of me, so yay. Oh, I'm that next me that made my day I, <laughs> of staying indoors with my kids. <laughs> exactly. Good luck. Please stay safe out there. Um, self quarantine. Wash your hands. Everybody listening, as well as Melissa. Yes. Um, we'll all get through this, obviously. But let's all do our part together and, and beat this thing. We will. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day. Thank you. You too. This has been Voice Actor Showcase. Visit our website at voiceactorshowcase.com. If you'd like to be featured on this podcast, contact us at voiceactorshowcase.com. Thanks for listening.